Is it even possible to get a fair trial anymore? Alex Murdaugh's attorney says his client did not get a fair trial. Did you anticipate that there would be a guilty verdict? We did not think the state had proven guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. This juror said I was influenced. I've never heard or seen anything like this. This is something that is so outside the norm. It's shocking. It's, it's still shocking. Well, I'm joined by Alec Murdoch's defense attorney, Jim Griffin, as well as high-profile criminal trial attorney and media legal analyst, Sarah Azari. Now, they co-host The Presumption, a podcast that focuses on our broken justice system and the impact the media has on high-profile cases like Murdoch. Jim, what was your reaction to the ruling? Did you anticipate that there would be a guilty verdict? No, we did not anticipate that there would be a guilty verdict. I mean, the, if you analyze the evidence, we did not think that, that the state had proven guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They spent two weeks of a six-week murder trial doing a character assassination over Alec Murdoch's admitted financial crimes. But when you look at the evidence that was actually presented, you know, I, I think you, you really objectively have to come away with there is reasonable doubt. We, we were surprised that the verdict came back so quickly. And, you know, we started asking questions. And the more questions we asked, the more questions that have arisen. Do you think the judge made the wrong decision when you asked for a retrial? And we were not surprised with the judge's ruling. The state of South Carolina spent six weeks uh, under the watchful eye of the world trying this case. And our state judiciary put its best foot forward. And after the trial, the trial judge received a lot of accolades. The prosecutor received a lot of accolades. And then we later learned that, that the clerk of court tainted with the process. And to grant a new trial would be expensive and embarrassing. So we felt like that we had an uphill battle to convince the trial judge that we were entitled to a new trial. And Jim, what is it that the clerk Becky Hill did that you think crossed the line? Through this evidentiary hearing, we learned that um, at least five jurors have testified under oath or by affidavit that she made comments to them, private comments about the merits of the case. Five of the jurors say that right before Alec testified, she commented on how to judge his credibility, Dr. Phil. I mean, she says, don't just listen to what he says, watch him closely, watch his actions, watch his movements. And then the alternate, Dr. Phil, testified before she was excused, she heard Becky Hill say, this verdict shouldn't take you long. Now, you, you've had experience with trials, and you know this is something that is so outside the norm and it's shocking. It's, it's still shocking. Yeah, I mean, that clearly stinks to high heaven. I, I, <laughs> I agree with that. And, Sarah, you say you were live tweeting during this trial. Mm -hmm. you, you were all over it. When did you feel something was amiss here? From the very beginning, Dr. Phil, I saw very early on that justice looked really different in this case. Um, there was about three weeks of inadmissible, like Jim said, character assassination evidence that came in, which was about Alec being a dirty thief and a liar. And so, of course, by the time he took the stand, um, it, he was done. I mean, the, the jury was not going to believe a word out of his mouth, and he was already convicted in their minds. So I, I think of all the trials that I have broken down in, the, in media, this was really one that stood out because of all of the sidebar stories and twists and turns and uh, a system that was really different. I've tried cases all over the country, but it was very different what I was seeing in this trial. Well, there's no question that he's a thief and a liar, right? Yeah. <laughs> admittedly, to it. admittedly so. Yeah. But Dr. Phil, the, the that's not what he's on trial for. But. Right, and, and the state convinced the trial judge over our objection that he killed his wife and son to distract from a financial investigation. I mean, he put himself right in the center murder of a investigation. murder investigation yeah. to distract from a financial investigation. Yeah. Now, now, that is illogical in our view. Well, from the, the psychological standpoint of, of a trial, sometimes a client will do a modified mea culpa on something that's not actionable in that case to buy credibility with the jury. I agree that that happens. It certainly didn't happen in this case. I mean, Alec had admitted mm -hmm. his financial crimes well before he was ever charged with a murder case. He admitted that he hired somebody to shoot him in the head. Correct. 
I mean, this, this is an odd duck. I mean, nobody believed he was uh, an opiate addict, and he was one of the worst kinds I've seen. You know, and people don't understand that um, addiction is not just about transacting pills and buying pills. It's a whole lifestyle. Like, yeah. So shooting himself in the head is also, you know. I find that the clerk of court is not completely credible as a witness. She stated to the clerk of court, Rhonda McElveen and others, her desire for a guilty verdict because it would sell books. She made comments about Murdoch's demeanor as he testified. And she made some of those comments uh, before he testified to at least one and maybe more jurors. Did clerk of court Hill's comments have any impact on the verdict of the jury? I find that the answer to this question is no. Well, that court clerk, Becky Hill, was called to the stand to testify, so let's take a look at what she had to do to explain herself. When did you first decide you were gonna write a book? I think a thought was there, a very fleeting thought before the trial. Let me give you an example. You indicate riding back from Moselle that you and three other people were in a car and you all decided adamantly, I think was the word you used, um, that he was guilty, that he had killed his wife and son. Is that what you put in the book? I can't remember if I put that in the book, but if you say I did, then I will did agree that with happen? you. We did have a conversation about what each of us thought. And the all four agreed that he was guilty, correct? And none of us were jurors. Becky Hill's infamous book, not new to this hearing. A fellow South Carolina clerk of court who assisted Hill in the Murdoch case also took the stand. She says Hill often talked about the book and how the trial's verdict could determine its success. The evidence was coming forth that it looked like he might be guilty, and she made a comment that he guilty verdict would be better for the sale of books. Jim, should there be charges against Becky Hill? What Judge Justice Toll found absolutely makes a case of violation of our obstruction of justice statute in South Carolina. Obstruction of justice includes attempted jury tampering. And, and so, yes, charges should be brought. Will they be brought? I don't know. What I do know is there is no larger conflict of interest, in our opinion, than the attorney general and his prosecutors evaluating whether to charge Becky Hill because they are so invested in the verdict against Alec Murdoch that needs to be independently reviewed. We had asked for that early on, and we continue to ask for that. We all know that you're asking the court to indict themselves for not controlling the process along the way, and it's real hard to get a court to criticize their own process. That's probably not gonna happen. And Sarah, let me ask you this. When certainly a court clerk that's plotting to write a book during a court case and interacts with anybody that's involved in a trier of fact role, crosses a line and nothing is done, does that send a message that this is a entertainment platform instead of a justice platform? I mean, what kind of message does this send? Yeah, a clerk is like the, the, the right hand to a judge. And so it's even worse. Um, but I think the irony here to me is that uh, even though this case started off as, oh, let's bring down Murdoch, this corrupt lawyer in, in low country, South Carolina, <laughs> as we're starting to see, there's a lot of other corruption, right, around. I mean, you, you've got Becky Hill, you've got her son who was wiretapping phone calls after his mother um, was under investigation. Uh, there's just so many sidebar stories to this case um, that that corruption, it's, it's I ironic. It's becoming more about other layers of, you know, yeah. institutions and people. One of the things I've learned in working with juries, which I did for years and years, is they believe that the judge and, and the clerk are kind of a, a unit. Mm -hmm. And they do kind of drape the judge's robes around the clerk mm -hmm. and the bailiff, and they kind of look at them as a, as a unit. So there's an intimacy there a familiarity there that lends credibility to that person. And Becky Hill testified that she gave the jurors pep talks and said, really pay attention, you know, sit up, pay attention today when Alec Murdoch is testifying and 
watch what he does, not just what he says. And she actually admitted to some of those things. And she testified after the verdict that she spoke to jurors about media interviews and that type thing. So it doesn't pass the smell test, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And the question is, was there impropriety? And is that the standard? Or is the standard that you need to avoid even the appearance of impropriety in order to know that someone has been given a fair trial. And trials are supposed to begin with a jury that is a totally blank canvas as to the parties and the fact pattern. Nobody comes into a trial without some preconceived notions. The idea is that they don't have preconceived notions about those parties and that fact pattern. Now, Alec Murdoch has eight million hits on Google. Is finding an unbiased jury even possible at this point? How are you ever going to impanel a jury? If that day comes, which we believe it will, it will be years down the road. And so hopefully there'll be another big case that has wiped this one off the national consciousness by then. But I can tell you for sure, we will not go back to Colleton County. Uh, we would ask for a change of venue to some other place in the state of South Carolina and hopefully, you know, get a different makeup of a jury. And hopefully we'll have a clerk who does it, what we believe, tamper with a jury during the process. Mm -hmm. It all boils down to getting an unbiased and fair jury. As you know, in high profile cases, it's, all, it's impossible to get a jury who's never heard about the case. Mm -hmm. But what you have to do is get a jury who can set that aside and decide the case in the courtroom. And people think sometimes that you, you select a jury and you don't, you deselect a jury. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's down to you got one strike left and you look who's next and you think, I, I don't like him, but I mm -hmm. damn sure don't like her. So right. I, I'm going like to take him. I'm going to take him because the next one is horrible. <laughs> I've seen lawyers many times, Judge, I want to strike this person for cause. I don't want to use one of my strikes. I want to strike this person for cause because they know the lawyer on the other side. And that's not really the test, is it? The test is, can you set that aside and follow the law as instructed? This juror said, I was influenced. Mm -hmm. and, and I did not set it aside. And that's why it's so important that Everything the jury hears is in the open courtroom, in front of the defense counsel, the defendant, in front of the judge. But when you have communication back in the jury room by a court official about the merits of the case, I mean, we, we, we are helpless to deal with that during the course of a trial because we don't even know about it. And, and y'all's point is you got a steep enough hill to climb as it is. You shouldn't have to deal with somebody coming in, doing an in run after hours behind closed doors, talking secretly to the jurors. Exactly. There's no question that there's a violation when a clerk goes mm -hmm. and starts telling people, watch what he does, watch this, watch that, watch right. the other. If he got a new trial and he was found not guilty, he may never take another free breath in his life given what he has admitted to and the deals he's mm -hmm. struck on financial crimes, right? That's correct. The plea that he did in state court and he's gonna be sentenced in federal court here in, in the next few months, I suspect. I mean, he's gonna get north of probably 22 to 25 years. He's 55 years old, so. Yeah, so. I mean, that's, uh, that's a lot, he's could not be a lifetime, to, yeah. Yeah, he's not likely to be out. I met Becky Hill three weeks to the day after Alex Murdoch was convicted of double murder. We had an initial phone call, hit it off instantly, and decided we were gonna write a book together. She had known the Murdoch family for about 20 years. I think Becky Hill's two worlds collided. As clerk of court, she was supposed to be Switzerland, but as a real person who knew Alex Murdoch, she felt he was guilty. The clerk of court is supposed to be neutral. Becky loved the limelight. She loved getting photographed, and she loved being interviewed as well. I'm not sure she used the best judgment in conducting interviews and setting up book signings from her courthouse office. So after our book came out, I felt like I got caught in the Becky blender. She got jury tampering allegations, ethics violations, and then her son got involved in alleged wiretapping. And the biggest thing involving me is I discovered that she plagiarized our preface. 
When I found out, I was shocked. I was caught off guard, and the first thing I did was call her. She told me she felt she was under deadline pressure and she needed some more content to help us fill out the book. I just never would have imagined that Becky would have plagiarized a chapter. She's an elected official. I don't think Becky's a malicious person at all. I wonder if she had to do it all over again. She would have made different decisions. I also think she may have gotten a bit overwhelmed working on the trial of the century. It was really a perfect storm. Well, Neil says his wife met Becky outside the courthouse during the trial. So you didn't know her. It was, you got introduced to her. That's correct. And she was on the prowl. She was looking for a way to get a book and get it out there. And she liked the limelight. She liked the, liked the limelight. I mean, I've, I've been in the TV news and world and, and, you know, fame is interesting and you can get intoxicated by fame, no question. Did she think the book would do better if there was a guilty verdict than if there wasn't? We never discussed that, and, and I don't think it mattered one way or the other. We were just simply following her journey, preparing for the trial of the century, operating it, dealing with all the factions, and then dealing with a little bit of how she's known the Murdoch family all of her life. So it never entered our minds as to whether it was guilty, innocent, or mistrial whatsoever. Were you aware that, that Becky Hill had asked the ethics committee for their opinion about the book? Yeah, we had conversations about it, Sarah. And, and that she told the ethics committee that she was just gonna write a book about the general trial process, not about the Murdoch trial, right? That's correct. But it was really about the Murdoch trial. Yeah, it was her experience. Her to so be you weren't concerned book. about the ethical... Well, I was concerned to the, to the point that we actually suspended writing the book for about a week or two mm -hmm. while the Ethics Commission sort of came back with what they thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was this an ego play or a money play for her, or both, or neither? I don't know that it was a money play because we self-published it, so together we were $30,000 in the hole as we started. So I, I don't know that it was that way. Um, was she talking about buying a lake house? Yes, that was certainly uh, uh, a stretch goal. Well, why did she write the book? Well, she just thought this was a moment in time that may never be replicated uh, for decades and such. And Well, so she was a first draft historian? Is that what you're saying? She kind of looked at it as uh, chronicling a little bit about how to prepare for it and then how to deal with it and the fact that her connection with Alex Burdos. So yeah, she wanted to be able to have a book. Neil, she was taking selfies in front of the courthouse with she trial did. watchers. <laughs> she did. She enjoyed that. You know, she, here's the thing about her. You know, you know the Andy Griffith show. She's really, she's really Aunt B. You know, it's kind of welcome and hospitable. And yes, she took selfies and she handed out her cards if anyone had questions. Do you, do you think Aunt B would plagiarize portions of a book to be the first one out? <laughs> <laughs> you should be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. I want to be a talk show host. <laughs> I think you'd be pretty good at that too. <laughs>